The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Macquarie Investment Management Global Limited, ABN 9008615960, AFSL 237843, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice advice or services, or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up over the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Macquarie Asset Management is a global asset manager trusted by institutions and individuals to generate long-term value and drive positive outcomes. Specialist investment expertise across public and private markets, including real estate, infrastructure, agriculture and natural assets, asset finance, private credit, equities, fixed income and multi-asset solutions. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We are trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but actually do work and maybe try and find the right time and the right weight for your clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform, and obviously all information contained here is general in nature. So here we go. In a year in which we have seen ladies stand up on planes and ask us what is and is not real, and if you don't understand that reference and look it up because it's hilarious, I can assure you that with 60% chance that my guests in front of me are in fact real, but the assets in which they speak are very much 100% real, and it is the holding of said assets that makes up such an important part of portfolios, but where to hold, how much, also why or why not. Therein lies the game. This week, we're all about REITs and real assets, and I couldn't think of two better guests to get into it with. I am joined by Jody Fitzgerald, Head of Institutional Portfolio Management and Solutions at Morningstar, and James Maydew, Global Head of Listed Real Estate at Macquarie Group, formerly of AMP, before the sale of the Global Equities and Fixed Income Business to Mac Bank in 2022. Jody, James, how are you now? Good, thank you. Good. Thank you for having us. Fantastic. Um, AMP to Mac Bank, that's 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 quite a jump. I can imagine culturally that, that the shift would have been significant. Now we won't go into that too much on there, but let's just start. James, uh, I always ask the similar question of, of anyone that comes through: What do you do, and how do you make money? Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, it's a change uh, moving from AMP to to Macquarie, but uh, you know, really uh, happy and privileged to be at the organisation. And what we do simply is invest in real estate which is liquid. That's how we think about the REIT asset class. And we do it on a global scale, investing for clients all across Australia, New Zealand, and the rest of the world. Okay. So if we break it down, what is an either, please, either of you jump in, what actually physically is a REIT, just so that we're all uh, in the same context and the same boundaries in which in which we are construed for the purposes of this podcast. Joni, yeah. you're, you're jumping at this one. Yeah, sure. Okay. So a REIT or a real estate investment trust, effectively what it is is a collation of property assets in a listed vehicle. So you'll hear the phrase A REIT, which refers to Australian REITs. G REIT, global REITs, very, very uh, inspiring uh, acronyms there that people have come up with. But in effect, what you are doing is getting a listed version of an unlisted asset. Those assets could consist of uh, office property, in industrial property, retail, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah, so that, that that's a REIT. They usually play an important role in portfolios because even though they're listed and therefore have 
equity type characteristics, there's also a yield characteristic and they do behave differently in some points of the market cycle. So they are an important diversifier in a multi-asset portfolio. Well, okay, to the average Australian, and let's talk about the average Australian, um, which we know many of them, uh, they, to some of them are my best friends. Uh, the, to the average Australian, property means residential. Uh, yes. To many advisors, property means residential and factories and office blocks, but it's actually much more complex sector than it isn't it? So it, it, can we sort of drill down to specific, you know, just a, a bit more with what are the various types of investable property that there are? James, I'm looking at you. Yeah, great. So when we think about the, the asset class, I'd like to take a step back. You know, why was this asset class created? Mm-hmm. And the reason for that was to give mum and dad investors in the 1960s exposure to the economic benefits of real estate, which is too large for them to invest in. And so it started with office buildings and shopping centers, but over time, particularly in the last decade or so, has really evolved into other areas, healthcare, aged care, digital real estate, shelter real estate. It is getting access to necessity uh, real estate that exists, which is perhaps disconnected from the near-term economic cycle that perhaps it used to be back in the day. So it's less about office buildings and shopping centers today, and it's more about the necessity real estate that I just spoke about. Yeah. Now, I, uh, let's go into some of those necessity real estate sides as well. And um, This is something I do actually want to drill into for myself too, because I've been, I'm just going to say data centers. And I'm just going to yep. let I'm just going to let you talk on data centers because I, I, and if you want to stretch it out, but I'm going to say that the artificial intelligence revolution has has really brought data centers to the fore. Uh, how big now? A, a, a REIT a REIT gives an investor a chance to invest in property, actually you know real assets and real estate, in various places, offices around the world, with an expert in charge, in the expertise that that you're seeing, how is artificial intelligence changing the, the investment shape for what we're actually filling buildings with? Do you yeah. understand? You no, know, I do. I do. Yeah. I do. Okay. So, you know, investing in anything is, it should be about what are you trying to achieve? And if you think about the data center market, it is a building that has the infrastructure within it to connect people and industry to the internet, very simply. And, and we're trying to invest in the data center assets that are um, are, are at the at that at that connectivity point between those those two areas. So it's the gateway to the internet. So it's been relevant. It's been around for decades, but obviously in more recent times with the the change in how we're doing things, we're not in office buildings as much. Mm-hmm. We're we're not in shopping centers as much. You know, we are doing things over Zoom. This podcast, for example, or how you listen to your uh, your on content demand through Spotify or watch a movie through Netflix. That's all being facilitated by an asset that could well be in our portfolio, which is a data center located here in Sydney. But with AI, it's it's changing everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of the day, companies globally don't yet know how important AI is going to be. They don't yet know how they're going to use it or how meaningful it's going to be. But there's one thing for certain. When you see NVIDIA and their sales go absolutely crazy, there is going to be one key beneficiary of that because the chips that NVIDIA are making are being put into the data centers that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, when you think about the asset class, think about how can you get exposure to how your life is changing and evolving? And if you've been on a Zoom call, if you've been downloading a Netflix movie, you're helping and contributing to the demand that is the data center market. Mm. Yeah. And I think also the evolution of any asset isn't specific to uh, real estate. So, you know, leading on from that effectively, if you think about just from a global equity perspective, if you think of what a standard tech stock was yeah. during the tech bubble, it was, you know, someone in a garage somewhere with no cash flow. Today, it's a very different cash flow, you know, cash cow, huge amounts. So, you know, they're very different. So, all assets evolve over time in terms of their characteristics. So what's super important is understanding the evolution of those characteristics and what do you need to understand to determine whether or not an asset is worth investing in. The, the, the reason why I brought that up isn't to talk specifically about AI, although it, it fascinates me and the companies within and the office and, and the, the, the necessity for the pipes and plumbing that is that. The reason I brought that up is so that it could evidence that you're on top of and, and the idea of going into a REIT is so that you can invest in 
those real assets with an expert who is actually deciding the shape of what it is that's investing underneath it. Hmm. That's the advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. And being able to actually take advantage of understanding the old assets, I guess, in terms of that used to be quite popular and how they're evolved. And, you know, office is probably the case in point in that most of us work from home a couple of days a week and, and so forth. And, you know, there's been, you know, very well broadcast businesses that are struggling to get people back in the office in the US, it's extraordinarily hard to get people back into the office. Yeah. Um, so that has a significant impact on, you know, the role that office might play from a real estate or what you might be expecting from a return profile for that investment. But then also what those office buildings need to do to attract people back. So the idea that they're actually having to greenify the offices and, and evolve these spaces to make it more appealing for people to come back in. So understanding that and the impact from a return perspective is important. And James, maybe you can dovetail into that. Yeah, I'm just going to sit back and just drink my coffee. You yeah. no, no, that, that's a great segue. <laughs> so uh, we're concerned about uh, office buildings like, like many are because office is an asset class that – uh, is is cyclical in nature and is predicated on essentially white collar employment. And if that is not growing, then um, th- you're therefore not going to see the the necessary growth within your rents and in your valuation to justify the risk that you're taking. That's a comment you can make at any point in a real estate cycle. And we're at a point now where rates have risen dramatically. We are seeing asset values in office starting to come under pressure. But you also have this line in the sand where technology has really changed the way we do things. So it's no longer just the cyclical discussion, it's the structural element. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee every CFO globally is having a conversation around how they can save costs. The economic environment we're in is more challenging than it's been in a decade. And therefore, you need to look to where you can save costs. The fact that most buildings are at best, 50%, 60% full on a Monday and a Friday suggests to us that CFOs and CEOs and uh, and anybody who has any influence over the cost line is looking at where they can pull in uh, their, their, their costs. Now, that that's the office markets. And I do think that when people talk about commercial real estate, they kind of start there. And they think about office because it's the most visual, uh, you know, you see, you know, the start of a movie or you see, you know, the start of a television program and you'll typically see a cityscape, which is going to be office buildings. The reality is in the real estate market, office accounts for a very small portion of what we're doing mm-hmm. and how we're thinking about the opportunity. So it's about, you know, investing in real estate sectors that are growing with the evolving economy. So think about that delivery that you received last week from Amazon or from Woolworths or Australia Post, that's come through a industrial facility that has been built for the purpose of servicing you as the customer. That's a large part of what we're doing in our portfolio, uh, as is the, the rental property that um, someone is living in uh, who and, and simply they perhaps can't afford a mortgage right now or don't have enough savings to be able to put down a deposit. That real estate for residential is a necessity form and investing for us in that area is um, somewhat defensive. So we, we run the, the, the full uh, spectrum of real estate. Uh, and to be clear, you know, the office component of that is, is a very small part of it. Yeah, that's all right. So where do we actually see the work from home trend settling? Uh, and, and this is a nice sort of conversation to have. And we've had many conversations actually just as we were, before we came into the podcast, we we're talking about the various areas where we live how often we come into work, annoyances that we have with various people <laughs> that we work with, which is part of the fun and the enjoyment. And we did miss it. I missed I missed the people that I didn't like working with <laughs> during COVID. I want to get back to so that I can remember what it was like to not to not be with you anymore. But where, where do we sort of see that settling? Uh, look, I think that's a tough question to answer. I think the one – Ed, the one positive to come out of COVID, if I could say it in that there phrase, are, it's fine, it's fine. was um, the so, – so while for a long time the technology has been there for people to work from home, it really didn't get any sort of traction effectively. Uh, so I think the one positive is that now because we were forced to work from home, businesses have recognised actually people can be productive from home. And if they're not productive from home, that's a staffing issue as opposed to a you know, productivity issue yep. with regards to technology and so forth. Um, so I think the one of the real advantages is, and, and I say this as a woman, right? So because the, it's usually been historically women who had part-time roles because of you know childcare and so forth. Yes, yes. It now makes it really feasible for people to actually interact with the workforce more 
um, but doing it from home. And I think that's a real positive. I've, I would be surprised if we ever go back to fully five days a week in the office because I think some of that flexibility is also what's attractive um, to staff, particularly younger staff coming through who have, you know, a little bit of a different view of what the work life should actually be. Mm. But, yeah, sort of in general, I, I, I would find it hard sort of reversing. I do think it is important to get into the office, though. Our CEO made a statement which I thought was actually brilliantly defined it, which was innovation doesn't happen over Zoom. Correct. So while, Correct. while you can sort of be productive from home and you can do a lot of things, if you want to actually innovate, face-to-face is so much better. And I think the other element um, as a manager that's really important is we sometimes forget – the younger grads and the younger people coming through, how much they learn through osmosis. So if they're not sitting in the same environment as us and being able to absorb the conversations and so forth, it really slows down their learning. So I think as managers, we have a responsibility to make sure that we have our teams physically together at least a few days a week. Yep, and that's, that, that, that is the truth. Uh, James, I'm thinking your opposite number over at Invesco – I was talking to him about a year and a half ago. He he had an amazing quote, which is that if you want to do your job, you can do it from home. And obviously, he's talking his own book on this one because he needs. He's they're big on on the residential stuff. Oh, sorry, on the commercials on the commercial space. They he said if you want to do your job, you do it from home. If you want to get promoted, you need to come into the office. Yep. And I I do honestly believe that that's true. That yeah, that, that that if you're going to, what's your what's your view on the future of commercial? Yeah, taking a global lens to it. It depends on where you are, really. So in Asia, uh, culturally, being in an office is a lot more important. And as soon as the opportunity to be back in the office was there, most people did it. So yep. Japan, for example, is is now almost back to normalized levels. Where we have more, um, you know, less influence from a cultural input before we even start, I think it's it's up for debate. I, I don't disagree with that statement. And those that are more visible are are clearly, um, you know, setting the tone about what they want to to be achieving. Now, at the end of the day, talent is the most important factor in this whole discussion. Mm-hmm. And when the balance of power sits with talent, then that's going to ultimately determine whether um, they are going to be wanting to come into an office environment or choose to go elsewhere if you enforce that. Now, the other level uh, or, or, or area of discussion that probably needs to be brought into this is in the United States, we are seeing perhaps the most challenging return to office profile. Yes. Some of that is actually related to safety. Go on. So uh, in some major cities in the US, they have changed the legislation because there's such a backlog that uh, you are able to take anything from a shop under $1,000 and um, you cannot be um, prosecuted. Prosecuted. Yes, yes, I've heard of this. And, and uh, corporate corporate policies are actually changing to not to not pursue people who are taking from shops as well. Which is crazy if you stop and think about that as a as a concept. What it does for the uh, the streetscape, what it does for the the how people feel uh, mm. in being in an office environment which is surrounded by stores, and you know you are seeing those tenants of those retail stores pulling out because they, they, they don't have the required security to manage this process. So in what we're having is uh, employees in some US cities saying, I frankly don't feel safe commuting to the office. Mm-hmm. And that's a very different conversation saying, hey, you should get back to the office because you know, your chances of being promoted are lower. Yeah. Safety is a, is, a, is a real concern. And defund the police in the US has obviously been a, a, a factor in that. That's uh, – it is. And if you can't ensure – I mean, definitely in Australia, imagine if you couldn't ensure your employee's safety on their way to and from work, that everything oh. would just stop spinning. That'd be a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a nightmare. But th- there's another example, not to get not too specific, another example of the expert who's running the portfolio making those decisions and that means that those are the advantages that you have as an investor in, as opposed to doing it direct. Social shift, social shift, legislative shift in a different country, changing the way that the investment is made underlying. That's that's why you would invest in a REIT. Now, uh, slide- sorry, if I can just jump in and dovetail off that Go comment. I think you know if we can almost sum up the entire conversation we've had at the moment with regards to risk. So whether it is risk of structural change, uh, interest rates, which we haven't gotten to yet, and cap rates and so forth. Um, you know, if you go back over the last sort of. 10, 15 years with perpetually falling interest rates, risk has not been appropriately priced in the market for a very, very long time. 
We are now stepping into an environment where that is no longer the case, um, mainly because, A, we've had some structural shifts, some social shifts that obviously change the dynamics of whether it's properties or whether it is any other asset that we're looking at. Um, And at the same time, we're having risk being repriced from, from an interest rate perspective. So I think understanding that what might have worked over the last decade is not potentially going to work in the next decade, and that's the real importance of you know, having experts who understand the asset class who are sort of looking at it. Yeah. Actually, I think, sorry, also, while well, I'm just on it, we probably should- oh, This is should, the gear change I was about to make. So yeah, yeah, we probably, because <laughs> if we are going to get into interest rates, I think it's really important we probably define cap rate. Yes, um, yes. Because, uh, this is something I've always had to do in the past. Go ahead. Yeah, because I know a lot of people, like you'll hear people say, oh, cap rate expansion, but you know, so, well, what does that mean? <laughs> it, hasn't, it hasn't really been relevant until- Last year. So it's. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so. What is it? Sorry. Go so on. simplistically, like some people might have in their mind it's the interest rate. And well, yes, that's an element of it, but it, it isn't. It is. What you're effectively looking at is the cap rate is trying, or well, capitalization rate, as the actual word is, is it's effectively the annual operating cash flow yield that you can expect from the asset based on the price that you've actually paid for the property. So the calculation for it is effectively your net operating income. So that becomes important with regards to the discussion we've just had in sense of can you get the same income out of a commercial real estate versus an industrial, et cetera, et cetera, that you used to be able to minus the operating expenses. And then that's where the interest rate element comes in is the operating expenses, given that a lot of these um, assets may have significant levels of debt that have to be refinanced at higher levels of interest rates. So it's the operating income minus uh, the operating expenses divided by the value of the property, etc. So yes, we're talking about interest rates, but we're also talking about the ability for them to generate income and how that can be shifting in the go forward environment as if, well. If I use the term hurdle, would that make it a bit more easy to sort of understand that yeah. that's, that's what you need to jump over to make, make it money. worthwhile? Exactly. Yeah, and, totally. And if, it's, if it's not worthwhile, then don't yeah. do it. Yeah. So going back to that comment around risk is that when you had falling interest rates, right, is you can, if you think of that formula, income minus operating expenses, a lot of which is going to be your debt servicing. Um, you know, divided by the property value, you can see that that was quite beneficial for, for real estate assets. But as debt, as, um, the, the issue, and James, you'll, um, certainly be closer to this with regards to individual cap, uh, REITs, is that in an environment of very low interest rates, if REITs have got, or the businesses have gone in and actually taken up debt, and they're at the point now where they're going to have to actually refinance, effectively, then they're going to have to refinance at higher interest rates and that's going to be impactful on their their net operating income effectively. Um, so that needs to be taken into consideration uh, from, you know, from an investment perspective. So all these trends we're talking about in terms of, you know, data centres, office, etc., it boils down to what income can they bring in? Well, that's uh, in generally speaking, without putting too much of a timestamp on this, what, do you, what is the Morningstar view on interest rates for the next 12 months? Uh, we don't forecast oh, sorry. anything. Um, and the reason why is because uh, there's one thing I know for certain. Any forecast I give you will be wrong. Okay. <laughs> so that I know for certain. That's you can the best take, answer, you can I'm take sorry. that one to the bank. Yeah. Um, and anyone who claims that they can forecast what's going to happen in the next 12 months with any certainty, I would suggest run away from them. They're all because, out there though. Yeah. But you know, it, it, <laughs> some of my best mates. <laughs> okay. You need some new friends. Yeah. Um, but the, <laughs> uh, the reality <laughs> is what we operate in a world of uncertainty and there are a lot of different paths that we can take from here. And as investors, what we need to do is understand what are the probabilities of the different scenarios that could play out and how can that then impact the valuation of the assets that we're looking at. Um, with regards to where we're at, the, the narrative in the market has really changed over the last few months. You know, Over the last 18 months, 12 months, it's all been about what's the peak rate going to be? When, when are rates going to peak? The narrative is now shifting to how long will we be at peak rates? That's right. And I think that's kind of a really interesting shift because if you go back, you know, a few months ago, the market was pricing in and and is actually pricing in for 2024 rate cuts. And the question is whether or not the market is actually getting a little bit ahead of itself. Um, We've actually had, you know, 10-year yields hit a peak, a high that we haven't seen since 2007. Um, So there's definitely some sort of shifts happening in there. So I think there's two paths from here. Um, the reality is we still have, it's really the whole reason why interest rates have been on the rise is central banks are trying to put a lid on inflation. And while there's been a lot of discussion around inflation being associated with COVID and UK and war and supply issues, 
the reality is a lot of it at this point in time is actually demand-led. We have a good old-fashioned overheating economy, really low unemployment, you know, strong consumption that is starting to slow, etc. The only way, unfortunately, to get wage inflation, which has been a problem in places like the UK, the US, less so here in Australia, under control is to raise interest rates and deliberately slow the economy. And that is exactly what has been happening effectively. However, it hasn't been as effective as you would have think. So the yield curve has been telling us that for the last year, we should be heading into a recession. It should have already happened it's, by now. It's been the most <laughs> televised recession to come that hasn't eventuated. It could already be here. They keep Who saying. Who knows, I've right? One of those and and okay. the reality is it's really hard to ignite a recession when you've got low levels of unemployment. Yeah. And that's, that's just sort of a reality of it. And that's another thing COVID did is it really shifted the participation rate. So it's yeah, you were just, uh, as you were just mentioning about, yeah. about, about the, the whole fleet of people who weren't in the workforce uh, in any real proportion are now front row center. Yeah, and then there's you a want lot them to of leave. Well, no, there's a lot of other people, the <laughs> people you. who are in the baby boomers who were getting close to retirement who got through COVID and just went, "I'm done, right? I'm, yeah. uh, life's more important," and have tapped out. Particularly in the US, the participation rate has actually fallen quite substantially, mm. and it's not clear yet whether that's a structural shift or, or whether that will actually. Um, whether that will change. So from here, you know, the, the reality is, is that even with when you still have strong demand and low levels of unemployment, it's quite feasible that the neutral level of rates, so the level of rates that we need to see on, on average over the remainder of this cycle could be a lot higher than what the market's anticipating. The flip side of that, though, is that as inflation starts to fall, what really matters for economic activity is the real level of rates, so the nominal minus inflation. So as inflation starts to fall, (laughs) the real level of rates could actually start rising and that would actually be quite restrictive on the economy. And that's not the remit of central banks. So it's feasible that they might start to calibrate interest rates for where inflation is landing and what the real rate is, but it's really hard in the current market environment to see uh, why or how any of the central banks globally could start cutting rates significantly from here, given low levels of unemployment and the possibility that inflation could surprise on the upside. That's the risk from here. I love it. That uh, you could not have put it any better, Jody. Thank you so much for that. So let's go. Let's get down to the brass tacks then. Based on what you've said, if hurdle rates stay higher for longer. And the risk-free rate stays say, means that safer assets can be invested in for less risk, which is mm-hmm. the entire point of what, what investing is all about. Where do REITs fit into portfolios? Yeah, so we think REITs play an important role in portfolios from a diversification perspective. So, you know, my role, I'm a multi-asset portfolio manager. Um, so our portfolios will have an allocation to REITs. The size of that will vary through the cycle depending on where we're at. Uh, we have a strong focus on valuation. And so that's not to say we're value, but valuation. So yep. in other words, you know, is the probability of gain higher than the probability of loss based on the risk? Um, for us at the moment, we are, we think that the, um, the outlook for REITs is improving, definitely. And there's been a lot of correction in the price so far. Um, but we're still underweight. So we still think that potentially, uh, even though there's been a lot of devaluation already, the question is, is it enough given some of those structural shifts that we mentioned before, given the change in operating income that may come through, given the fact that some of these um, REITs need to roll debt over at potentially higher interest rates. Good point. And if the market is assuming that rates will start falling, which was what they were assuming sort of 12 months ago and I think was, you know, naively so, then they may not have discounted enough into the price of rates. So we are closing out our underweight, but at this point in time we are still underweight. Okay. And so, James, same question. In a, in a higher for longer environment, where do they fit into portfolios? Keeping in mind that this is what you do for a living. So yeah, I'm absolutely. Gonna say this. absolutely. <laughs> so... Um, recognize everything that we've just, uh, we've just spoken about. So for us, understanding where you can achieve real growth in your cash flow to offset increasing interest costs to offset against greater inflationary pressures is really important. So we absolutely want to look through and understand where can we sustainably achieve long term growth in cash flows from these assets. We also are laser focused on ensuring that high quality is at the center of everything that we're doing, and therefore that dovetails into leverage ratios. And so unlike 2008, 
the companies that are in the stock market today globally investing in real estate are a lot more focused on managing their overall leverage into a rising rate cycle. And what we are therefore seeing is well-capitalized businesses that are in a position to take advantage of any dislocation that may or may not happen in private real estate land. Yep. Because when you look to the US in particular, you will see certain participants in private markets that are over-levered, too reliant on one or two regional banks, have a very localized regional portfolio that simply won't be able to get refinancing as and when it rolls. That is a phenomenal opportunity for a well-capitalized REIT that has been sitting there waiting for that opportunity. So what we are seeing is not only the growth in cash flows from the sectors and the, and the stocks that fill those sectors that have structural growth to them, we're also seeing a bolt-on acquisition opportunity that is likely to present itself, which will set them up for the next decade or so. For Fantastic. Growth. So that the, the, there's opportunities out there, which is, it sort of comes back to the same thing that, that that I've mentioned before and many times in the past, that in times of trouble, trouble, times of change and uncertainty, similar to what we have now, that it's better to be with the smart guy instead of just being sort of the, mm. the, 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 the overall buy and hold just by the market sort of situation. More important to, to, to make sure that the manager that you are investing in is – good at what they do, which they are sure. You mentioned inflation, James. Mm. I, I don't want to ask it like this because I am legitimately – these are questions that have come off the Ensemble uh, mm. platform and so there's sort of bits and pieces in here. This is a bit of a leading one. REITs as a hedge against inflation. I'm just going to leave it out there and and let's just sort of see how this goes. I'm okay. just going to say depends and hand it over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> that's, good, that's good enough. Good I'm going to listen. Appreciate so. the handle. <laughs> no, it, it does depend. So yeah. it depends on your time, time horizon. Yeah. In the short term, REITs are listed on the equity market and therefore are at the whim of uh, the pricing of risk. We've seen interest rates move at the fastest rate that we've ever seen on record. And that gets repriced immediately in liquid assets because the most important uh, component that's going into the valuation is going to be the risk-free rate, which is up dramatically over that period. So in the near term, listed real estate REITs any form of risk asset didn't play the inflationary hedge that you would like it to do. Now, it also means that in real estate, you get with linkages to inflation protection in your leases, they are backwards looking. So when you have a very high period of inflation, it's going to be in 12 months time that you're going to see that protection come through. And we're now starting to see that hitting the cash flows. Mm. So those that have inbuilt inflation protection into their uh, into their leases are now starting to see that being delivered. So it, it really depends on your time frame. So in the short term, it's not going to be an inflation hedge, but over the medium to longer term, it absolutely is. Mm-hmm. Because if you have an asset which is real, it's physical, it's going to be a, a pretty good place to protect against the scourge of, of rising inflation just generally. I think we'd all understand that over the longer term. Yep. Think about, you know, our parents when they bought their homes and the numbers that they paid for those homes. Um, you know, that's the economic and growth and it's the inflationary um, environment that's, that's delivered that growth. But then to take that to the, to, 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 to the next stage, if you have an asset that's linked to uh, leases that are linked on a year by year basis to inflation, then you are going to get that protection coming through yeah. and, and it will happen. And, and so you have to make a call on whether can that tenant afford to pay that new increased rent? Yeah. So that's where your underwriting of the credit quality is important. And um, that's key to what we're doing, understanding the uh, the tenant, understanding the commercials, understanding their ability to service rising rents. And that goes to the heart of what we're talking about. In some sectors and in some industries, they simply won't be able to uh, take higher costs because they're in cyclical headwinds or they've got a str- in structural decline. So that's why it's really important to understand the assets. You know, we we have a team in five locations around the world, uh, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Sydney, London, and Chicago, boots on the ground, kicking the tires, understanding the risk dynamics to really showcase and find these opportunities uh, because you know real estate is a local asset class and, and, and understanding the lo- local dynamic 
is really important. I was about to, I'm just going to pull it back to a general portfolio construction comment yep. as yep. well, because the other question's probably been asked in, in the sense of how do I inflation proof my portfolio? And, you know, coming out of 2022, traditional diversifiers didn't diversify. And I, I, you know, to the point that over the short term, no, because they are, you know, equity you know, linked to the market and therefore linked to the risk-free rate. I think it's just really important for everyone to understand that, you know, 2022 and well, the last, you know, 12 to 18 months has been an unusual period because we effectively had asset class bubbles in every asset class because for the best part of the decade, central banks rigged the risk-free rate and held it at zero. So when the risk-free rate is zero, that has profound implications for the way risk is priced across all asset classes. Yep. So all asset classes had to have a capitulation as risk was repriced. That's occurred now. Um, yeah, going- 2022 was a really enjoyable year for all yeah. of us out there. So I think you know it's important to separate. You get those three standard deviation events every now and again, and that doesn't mean – that, that portfolio construction doesn't work. There's going to be times where it feels painful, but when you're looking at it over the longer term, there there is a role and it can provide an inflation hedge. It just depends on how it's priced at that point in time. The other point I would make actually um, is that people keep talking about inflation. Um, we need to remember that inflation is a rate, not a level. So it's just a comparison to a previous number. Yeah. So yeah. that huge amount of inflation that's already come, that's baked in. So if these REITs have been able to increase, uh, they're, they're not going to reduce it, right? So as inflation starts to fall, are they likely to actually go back and say, oh, we'll take that 10% increase and we'll reverse it? You know, so that, that could actually put them in very good stead to have that sort of inflation protection flow through. Excellent point. Um, once actually the, you know, cap rates and so forth, the interest rates have actually been repriced in. Okay. Well, look, I, I tell you what, we're just going to blast through a few of the questions that are here. Some of them, some of them are sort of interesting, and some of them we've sort of already covered anyway. So I might skip over some of those ones just to make sure that we've covered all the bases from the advisors and the people on the Ensemble Network who ask all of the questions that they can. I've got one here, and it relates to to the the offices, James, that you mentioned mm. just now that that you have boots on the ground around the area. I'm just going to read the question. Everyone knows the phrase location, location, location. How important is that in a commercial property context? Mm. No. Well, it's an important factor because at the end of the day, the most important component in real estate is having a tenant and their willingness to pay a rent, which is increasing over time. Mm. And um, when you have real estate cycles, then some of the more questionable locations when you're in the early part of a cycle, or the mid part of a cycle are more acceptable uh, around um, for tenants because they have you know uh, they don't have as many options when you're at the latter part of a real estate cycle then they you have a ton of options and therefore that's when tenants make the move so you know you will see tenants moving from peripheral locations in the Sydney CBD into the major core assets in central central Sydney uh, and that is the same for any location around around Australia yep. and so you know it's a core it's a core factor it's important and but in, in 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 real estate investing what it drives is the security of cash flow that that's the most important factor so location is one of them then understanding the quality of the covenant the tenant how much rent can they pay how sustainable is that rent you know, what is the trajectory of growth in the industry and sector you're investing in? So if we if we look at telecommunication towers, for example, you know, we're investing in the shift from 4G to 5G. You know, we're all using mobile technology uh, at, a, at a faster and growing rate. And that's a global trend. That is in a sweet spot for growth over the next five or so years. It's the same with data centers, the shift to cloud computing and on content demand before we even talk about AI that's going to see growth. If we think about Amazon and the growth in e-commerce, yes, you know, we've seen a great deal of growth in that industry, but we, we, we're we transforming from uh, a, a, a marketplace where you had no other option other than buying your goods in a shopping center 20 years ago to one where you can sit on your couch and get the same product, probably cheaper. So that just changes the entire dynamic. And we think there's there's a ton of runway for further growth in that area. So that's a long way of saying in everything that we're doing, location is vital, but you need to understand all of the other moving parts that go into 
choosing that location. Yep. Now, how much does decarbonization, I know this is, mm. is something that you've mentioned a few times uh, just in our in our preparation sure. for this podcast. How much does decarb, I'm going to say decarb, it sound like a funky, like a hipster. How much, how much does decarb, ESG, go. Yeah, it's table, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's table stakes. Yep. So if you are not focused on uh, the E, the S and the G as a corporate, uh, you will be left behind and you simply won't be able to fill your portfolio with tenants and uh, it's non-negotiable yep. and um, tenants also have you know their corporate uh, targets that they're looking to achieve and they will say I'm not going to occupy your building because it doesn't fill the requirement that uh, we need as a tenant to, to fulfill how many stars are we up to now is it seven stars or is that just made up uh, it's six stars, six stars. Still, <laughs> okay. you know, still in Australia yeah. but that's a great point because governments won't take occupancy of office buildings below a, cer- uh, 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 below a certain star rating. Yeah. And so this, this is a well-trodden path. I would say the Aussies are some of the best globally in this, them and the Europeans and the Kiwis. Some other parts of the world are playing catch-up and yeah. there's a long way to go. So we're likely to see regulation over time, which makes the, uh, the real estate, you can call it carbon- de- decarbonization or other factors of sustainability yeah. in the environment – is is going to get increasingly more important. Does that mean that, sorry, Jody, you go and then yeah, I've I was, got to- I was about to say, I think that, um, you know, it comes back into that whole, it's important to be on top of these issues. So the, the greening of buildings, right? So yeah. um, that if we go back to an earlier conversation about people working from home, so I'm specifically talking about office here, obviously, um, trying to get tenants back in, it is about having, well, Gen Z, they want to know that they're working in a building that's green. They're, you know, the way that buildings need to be fitted out to be, you know, more inducive of people coming back into the office. So you kind of have a green premium, but you also have a, you know, a brown discount as it's called. So office, <laughs> you know, office buildings that are not, um, you know, that, that don't necessarily have that sort of greenification or um, decarbonization element to it. But I think that's also really interesting in the sense of, so that can help you attract tenants. But if you have to actually repurpose or refit an office or change, you know, the, you know, so in London, offices will have gas and they're trying to change that to electric and so forth. There's a cost associated with that. And that, that fit out, that change has to then now also be financed probably at higher debt levels. So understanding the both sides of that in terms of you may need to do the greening of your building to attract a tenant, but that is going to cost you money. Can you do it in a cost-effective way that actually ensures that you can still, um, you know, return a decent re- uh, cash flow return to investors? Yeah, that's it. Uh, James, do you find that in the in the necessity in in the requirement to pursue something that's greener? That you are hamstrung from chasing some of the opportunities that might be available around the world. No. Um, okay. Well, there you go. No. Just what you pay for it. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, all about price. It, it's all about price. It goes to the core of investing in quality real estate mm. and the, the 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 best management teams globally of the companies or the REITs that we're invested in have been on top of this for for a very long period of time and uh, and you and you see that in the results. The the best managers get the best out of portfolios. And investing in sustainable buildings is a point of difference that will you know, be a, uh, a performance differential between you and those that haven't. No, oh, there you go. Okay, next question I'm going to get to is the specific or, or non-specific advantages of owning a REIT, especially for a self-managed super fund particularly. Now, I'm not sure who's of a quality of expertise to be able to answer this question, but if we could mm-hmm. just sort of keep it general – I'll answer the question and hopefully this will help someone on their way. So I'll, I'll take it from a very high level perspective. We're not giving any, uh, obviously yeah. no specific or tax advice is, exactly. is in this one, yeah. but it's a question that I have to ask and it's an answer that we've got of to give. Of course, you know, okay. I'm certainly not a tax advisor. I'm an investor in, in real estate globally and it depends on what you're seeking to achieve. Listed real estate is a diversified way of getting access to the economics of um, buildings and industries around the world. And um, investing in a global capability allows you to get access to the likes of Japan, the likes of Spain or France, Switzerland, Canada, the US, Mexico, and Australia. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. But um, the creation of the REIT asset class is in its very nature a tax-efficient vehicle. So being tax-efficient allows these companies to enhance their overall growth over the longer term. So if you think about, you know, not to get too deep here, if you think about 
Charles Darwin. And you think about wow. how... Exactly, we're going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I was expecting from that pause. But go on, yeah, sorry. And, and you think about how um, what we're doing here is investing in real estate assets that is there for everybody to see. Every analyst around the world can analyze the real estate fundamentals of the companies that we're investing in. Mm-hmm. That leads to the weak getting found out very quickly, not having a cost of capital, and not being able to grow. Mm-hmm. That means the strong gets stronger. And they take advantage of that. They take over the weaker and they grow and evolve and advance. So what you end up getting in the real estate asset class that is listed is a high quality exposure to the underlying asset class because the improvements have just honed over time. And so um, when we look at it today, you you can get an access to all of these sectors, all of these trends, all of these themes. That's all very great. But at the heart of it is the sustainability of cash flow driven by um, some great management teams. Jody, same question of, of where it goes. And then I think it's about time that we wrap it up, actually. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so it, when we think about asset allocation, um, there's a reason why we split out REITs and infrastructure as well, e- even listed. So we don't just say, well, that's Australian equities or that's global equities. It's specifically an allocation to REITs. And, you know, even though over the shorter term, it will take on some of the volatility and the characteristics of the equity market, over the longer term, it does have different behavioral elements that do offer diversification benefits in a portfolio. So we, de- uh, we, um, use REITs across all risk profiles, uh, within our po- uh, portfolios. Do you think it's extremely important to have an exposure offshore as well as domestically? Um, obviously, within our strategic asset allocation, we have a higher global allocation than than domestic, simply because of the depth. Right, you get m- more depth, more diversity, different types of properties, you know, etc. So we think that's really important. Uh, listed version though versus unlisted, I think, is probably a question that some people would have. It kind of just depends on the client. So obviously there are some clients that advisors might have that come to them with existing property holdings, whether it be, you know, a warehouse somewhere or an industrial site, et cetera. Um, and understanding, I think from, you know, generally that's probably something you can't liquidate. So you then need to build a portfolio around it, understanding that particular asset and what it is linked to. So what part of the market cycle is it linked to? And then understanding what else you have in the portfolio from a listed side and is there a high level of correlation between those risks that you need to consider. Um, but in general, the listed version of real estate assets is beneficial to most people because of that liquidity profile, particularly as, um, you know, individuals move into retirement. Most people uh, will have to draw down on capital as a part of their retirement and not simply rely on the income that is coming out from any of the investments. So therefore, understanding that and knowing that you can still sort of draw down on that capital in a tax-effective way in retirement is advantageous versus having an unlisted property that you can't liquidate. That makes sense. All right. In the final seconds of the show, I always have a last bids. This is your last chance. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Otherwise, I'll wrap it up. I'd just like to talk about Charles Darwin a bit more. So that's I was, going, about, I was going, going down a fun little path. Tar- little Charles Darwin <laughs> uh, on the Beagle. Look, the Beagle is going to come into to shore. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Jody Fitzgerald, Head of Institutional Portfolio Management and Solutions at Morningstar. And thank you, the Charles Darwin of Real Estate Investment Trust, James Medew, Global Head of Listed Real Estate at Macquarie Group. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. And I think that we've learned so much. If you want to know more, check out the Ensemble platform, Morningstar or uh, Macquarie will be able to help you out there. We've got links to everything at the end of it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for your time. Appreciate it.